Rules Committee will come to order. We're here for consideration of two measures, H.R. 2218 and H.R. 1892. And uh, I'd like to begin by, of course, welcoming everyone back, especially Mr. Webster. We understand you were caught in deep water on the 395, is what I was just told. And we know that uh, lots of people are dealing with the weather problems today. But we're here today, actually, for a very important celebration. It's the, uh, the diamond anniversary of the birth of our friend Elsie Hastings, day before yesterday. And so I think it's important for us to recognize that uh, I know that no one, let me just first say that there's no one in this room who's gotten anywhere close to 75 years of age. No, no one no one in this room anywhere close to 75 years. Of, so we want to congratulate you on your great accomplishment, Elsie. So happy birthday. Thank you all. Well, we're happy to first hear from the distinguished chair and ranking minority member of the uh, Committee on Education and the Workforce, and uh, so please, uh, Chairman Klein, without objection, your prepared remarks will appear in the record in their entirety, and we welcome your summary. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Ranking Member Slaughter, members of the Rules Committee, for inviting me here today to talk about uh, H.R. 2218, the Empowering Parents to Quality Charter Schools Act. Uh, as you may know, the House Committee on Education and the Workforce is working to reform the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Rather than accomplish this goal through one enormous bill, we've elected to advance a series of targeted measures that address key areas for improvement in the nation's education system. The legislation before us today is part of that effort. Twenty years ago, my home state of Minnesota pioneered the charter school educational model. Since then, 40 states in the District of Columbia have established laws to open charter schools. Charter schools are not the only answer to education reform, but they represent one way states and school districts can improve academic opportunities for families. Research has confirmed charters have an impressive impact on the academic achievement of students in cities across the nation. According to a recent RAM Corporation study, charter school students in Chicago and Florida had higher ACT scores, graduation rates, and college entrance rates than their peers in traditional public schools. 2009 study conducted by the Harvard Graduate School of Education in cooperation with MIT reported charter school students in Boston outperformed their public school peers across all subjects. Unfortunately, there simply are not enough charter schools to meet demand, and significant barriers to growth exist in the form of state caps and restrictive funding streams. This bill will modernize and streamline the federal charter school program, facilitate the establishment and replication of high-quality charter schools, and incentivize states to remove burdens to charter school growth. Specifically, this legislation will consolidate federal charter school program funding streams into the existing state grant program, allowing state educational agencies, state charter school boards, and governors to award subgrants to support new charter school startups. H.R. 2218 will also allow funds to be awarded for the replication and expansion of high-quality charter schools. I'd like to, uh, since you've kindly allowed my entire statement to be in the record, I'd like to address a couple of notes. We're adding a manager's amendment to the underlying legislation. This amendment is a product of substantial bipartisan negotiations and will improve the existing legislation by adding a provision that offers incentives to states that use charter schools to reach out to special populations, such as at-risk students. Additionally, the manager's amendment will address any lingering concerns about sustainable management and disbursement of program grants by directing the Secretary of Education to undertake proper planning efforts to ensure sufficient new grants can be awarded annually to the best applicants. We can no longer stand idle as hundreds of thousands of students are trapped in failing schools each year. It is past time to provide families more high-quality education options so all children, regardless of background or circumstance, have the opportunity to excel. By enacting the Empowering Parents to Quality Charter Schools Act, we can help open the door for countless parents across America to make choices about their children's learning experiences. I urge the committee to support this legislation and report a structured rule that encourages fair debate on the House floor. I want to thank you uh, for allowing me to testify today, and I want to here, thank my uh, friend and colleague, Mr. Miller, and his staff for working with us to produce this legislation. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify this morning, or this afternoon, on, on, this, uh, on this legislation. And, uh, Ranking Member, thank you. Uh, Slaughter, also thank you very much. Uh, I support this legislation. It was passed in the Education Committee with bipartisan support, and I'm hopeful it will receive similar support in the full Congress. 
And I want to thank Chairman Klein and his staff for working with me and my staff throughout this process, all, all of the members of our committee, uh, to include critical improvements in the, uh, in the legislation and in the, in the, certainly in the current law. The legislation is the first bipartisan piece of reauthorization of the Elementary Secondary Education Act. While charter schools only serve about 4% of our public school students, uh, in the urban areas they have become a very important part of our education system. We need to update the law to make sure that they can fulfill their full potential. Empowering parents through Quality Charter Schools Act encourages effective reforms that will help transform schools and communities. First, the bill makes significant improvements in the existing charter school program. It requires that charters be brought back into the traditional public system as opposed to running a parallel system. And it requires charters to actually serve all student populations, all student population, and therefore provides for more parents with real choices. And second, it prioritizes accountability. It puts student achievement first, and it greatly increases the accountability of charter school authorizers. Third, this bill addresses a reoccurring problem in charter schools, which is a lack of service to students with disabilities and English language learners. This, this legislation dramatically improves the access for underserved populations and requires better recruitment and enrollment practices for underserved populations. And but first and foremost, it focuses on the students. We can, and with that, we can help ensure that things that are happening in charter schools will happen in all, all charter schools by sharing those best practices and hopefully also back to the, to the regular public schools. I'm very proud to support this legislation. I think it's an important piece of legislation, and I think it breathes new life into the, uh, into the charter school movement in this country and, and makes them a full partner in providing uh, uh, new solutions to the problems that are confronted by many schools and so many states across the, uh, across the country. And I w again, I, I want to thank uh, Chairman Klein, and I hope that we will get the same kind of bipartisan support on the floor that we got in that. Well, gentlemen, thank you uh, both very much. It's a great day for us to see the two of you together on a, an issue uh, as important as this. We know that uh, in the past there's been uh, a lot of disagreement on education issues, and I'm one who's uh, always believed that um, when it comes to this issue, the ability to address the very, very, very serious and important need is something that needs to be done in a bipartisan way. And if we're going to maintain our competitiveness globally, we have got to do everything that we can to improve <coughs> the uh, quality of education in this country. And uh, the kinds of steps that you're taking in this legislation is very important. So I thank you for that. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome both of you to uh, the Rules Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you spoke very eloquently about this being uh, a bill for all students. Uh, I wondered if you could run through with me real quickly uh, some sort of uh, thought process that took place in the committee uh, or about your, you would en your envisioning uh, about how disabled students might benefit from this in particular, whether there is a group of people that perhaps uh, an autism school that may be formed as a result of this that could turn into a real best practice for education where groups of people are brought together. Perhaps it's uh, Down syndrome uh, people. Uh, all sorts of ways to look at it. Have you? Can you give me some content on the thought process that you and your vision and the committee has for how this will really impact special needs, intellectual or physical disabilities uh, for educating uh, our students? Thank you for the question. Uh, char charter schools already, in many cases, provide a quality education for students with special needs. But particularly, you have some charter schools who can focus now on students with special needs and, and reach out directly to them. We wanted to make sure that that was covered, that ability was covered in this legislation, and it is and encouraged. So uh, that uh, encouragement is in this bill. We've seen some examples of it, and I expect more to occur. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, this member uh, is interested as a result of my work with the uh, co-chairman of the Down Syndrome Caucus and sitting on other caucuses uh, where there are uh, educational uh, attributes attributed to people who have uh, physical or intellectual uh, needs. I'm interested if you could direct to me uh, anything that you have that's a study about best practices at charter schools, how they work well, uh, whether uh, it, it be autism or any other uh, physical or uh, intellectual disability for me to take home uh, since you've so forthrightly brought this up so that I could be a leader back home also on these. So if you have any best practices, I would be interested. 
I don't have any right here, but I will check, and if I can if get that available have, for you, I'll be happy to do right. that. But I do want to point out, uh, Mr. Miller mentioned in his comments, that one of the things we're trying to get out here is the sharing of best practices uh, to beyond charter schools to the larger school system. We'd like to see that happen. Clearly, there are charter schools that are achieving some remarkable successes, some not. I um, mean, let's be complete here. Some charter schools are not, but some of them are producing remarkable successes uh, in a variety of areas. Kids who have dropped out and are getting a second chance, for example, and, and certainly some with, uh, with special needs. But and, I'll see if I can get that for yeah, you. Thank you very much. And I've also seen, perhaps I don't know the name of the school, but in Denver, a Hispanic-oriented charter school uh, that the community came about and took some of their leading-edge students and really... They've gotten great results from that. Up to and including. Will the gentleman yield? I would yield to the gentleman from Colorado. Very proud of, I, I think, uh, could be one of two potential schools. The Ricardo Flores McGowan Academy in Westminster uh, has remarkable results. Elementary school, 90% uh, free and reduced lunch, over 80% English language learners. Yes. Uh, remarkable results uh, in, in right next to Denver, Colorado, Westminster. Good. Good. And, thank you, and I appreciate that. I uh, have a... Uh, 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 there is a uh, large amount of students in Dallas, Texas that find themselves what I believe is in need of charter schools and with a, with a district that has a high uh, Hispanic uh, population. I think it's very important and I have used this, not school as an example, but uh, I've used it as an example, but I've really looked at the results about how they did what they did and I'm very impressed. So. I thank both of you for being here. I yield back my time. Mr. Chairman, gentlemen, uh, I follow on sort of what Mr. Sessions was talking about. It's always been our experience, and I think New York has a iffy record sometimes on both public schools and charter schools. Um, but the major difference was always that the public schools took everybody uh, and that the charter schools chose students. And I, do I understand this legislation changes that? That charter schools are, are, are have to take anybody that applies. Well, we we set out to, if I might, we, we set out to, to to make sure that, that that students aren't rejected out of hand simply because they're English learners or they're students with with uh, with disabilities. In some instances, there's some evidence that charter schools have counseled those parents away from the charter school mm -hmm. when, in fact, the charter school might be a good fit for those particular child. Not necessarily for every child with disabilities mm -hmm. or every English learner. That's not that's not that's not the issue. So we want to make sure that, in fact, they're, one, they're reaching out to those communities to, to if, those, if those parents want to make application and want to, part want to participate in that. In some instances, in some cases, you will find that the public school system may be better uh, endowed to deal with some of those populations than, than that standalone charter is. Mm -hmm. But we don't want the presumption to be the, that, uh, uh, that, you, that those students have to stay in the, in, in the, in the public school system and, and let that work out. So... Right now, we're concerned that they're not reflective of the attendance tracks of where the charter schools are. If I, if I might, uh, in many students, and New York is certainly an example of this, but across the country, the charter school, the waiting list for charter schools is, is very long, and the students are selected by lottery. So there is already a requirement that charter schools educate these children. What we're trying to do is, in this is just clarify and emphasize but charter schools are not allowed to deny. They're part of the public school system. They're not allowed to deny. I know they're funded with public right. funds, but... Uh, time I, school. I mean, well, okay. depending on the makeup of them, but yeah, generally most of them are time one schools. So they, they have to take them. I, I understand that they don't sometimes. They, they don't. Yeah. I know. That, that's, uh, this legislation speaks to the issue. Frankly, I think if I had my choice, I, I would rather see the whole public school system upgraded so that we really educate the children and, and getting somewhere, but I appreciate that's a mammoth task that I think you're working on in any case. Well, I think this is part of that. I, I, I really believe, uh, uh, I've been a supporter of charter schools for some time, and I must say I was also an opponent of charter schools for some time, but I really think that they, they do provide a certain catalytic effect in terms of new practices and best practices uh, and, and uh, sort of the kinds of resources that schools need that go beyond just the question of, uh, of money in terms of a plan and, and in terms of uh, uh, the talent that's in the, uh, uh, in, in the school. And there was an interesting article, I think it was in the last day or so, about in Houston, 
where they're now, again, the, the, the so-called regular schools, if you will, the non charters are borrowing those practices back. That's, that was always the idea, but somewhere along the line they got into being competitive systems. Mm -hmm. They're really laboratories for experimentation, and many of them have been able to replicate within their own charter systems what they've been able to do, but, but sometimes the public school systems don't want to have those practices or they, they don't want to share them. And I think what we're seeing now is people understand that we've got to go back to this original model, which was the sharing of best practices. Why wouldn't you use them if they're working for the, the exact population that you're so concerned with in the public system, but you're not getting the results? Why wouldn't you look to say, well, how are they doing it down the street? Mm -hmm. And why are they having all that success? And so I think that's it's coming along. We're not home yet, but I think it's, it's starting to have a significant impact on those practices. What we expect of of teachers, I, I visited one school that absolutely stunned me. They had two teachers who were teaching English as a second language, and they had 17 students in this class, none of whom had a language in common, and the teachers spoke neither none of the languages that they had. It was absolutely astounding to me that, that they were able somehow to teach English to these children, um, as well as deal with untold amounts of emotional problems. So. School's different from it was back in the day uh, when we all went to our little schools. But, but even today, many, many teachers do many remarkable things on a daily basis. I mean, it's, we all know, you know. I hate to see them lose their jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Lutter. Let, let me just say that uh, listening to you say for many years you were an opponent and for many years a supporter, it reminds me of a line of one of our former colleagues who said, ours is one business where you can never admit to having learned anything because, of course, you're flip-flopping if you have. <laughs> Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for coming. I appreciate Mr. Klein speaking up and, and pointing out that charter schools are public schools. I, I think that we were about to get a misconception, I think, that they're not public schools. And as far as I know, everywhere they are also public schools. And I appreciate what, um, uh, what uh, Mr. Miller said about the idea behind charter schools when they were begun for them to be laboratories for experimentation. I completely agree with that. I think that's, that's why charter schools were begun in most cases. And... Um, and I think they are catalysts also. I think that they have helped the other public schools <laughs> in many cases examine what they are doing and look for ways to improve what they're doing. If you will, a little competition helps the situation. And I think the other thing that sets charter schools apart so often, which is something we've known from the research for 40 years maybe or longer, that what makes a really successful school is um, good teachers and administrators and parental involvement. And so often the charter schools have the, the devotion and parental involvement that children in the non-charter schools simply don't have. And that is often what makes the difference in what makes them successful. And again, the research has been out there for a long, long time that that's what separates the successful from the non-successful schools. And so if we could find a way to get parents more involved in all of the schools, I think it vastly improve our educational structure. So um, I, I support the legislation and um, uh, appreciate the presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you for the, thank you so much for the recognition. I, I'm with you. I don't know how I made it, 75 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, uh, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, um, ask unanimous consent to include in the record a statement of uh, Congresswoman Gwen Moore. In Ms. Moore's uh, statement, she says something that I agree with, and that is that this bill represents an important step in the right di direction towards better oversight and higher quality and strengthen civil rights for all students. And she then argues for uh, her amendments, one of which um, uh, she submitted 
would strike the provision that expands the types of applicants for the grants to include not only state education agencies, as under current law, and state charter school boards, but also governor's offices. And Ms. Moore makes the argument uh, that I would make, and that is that she's deeply concerned about permitting governors to receive direct grants from the federal government to oversee charter schools. And I'd ask um, uh, the uh, makers of uh, this bill uh, uh, what their general thinking was, and did they contemplate uh, changing politics over uh, uh, the course of time and the prejudices that all of us bring to the work that we do, and our governors as well. And the classic example, she went on to cite the Wisconsin uh, governor uh, and the fact that he and the constitutional officers um, adamantly uh, <coughs> opposed to um, uh, the traditional schools and uh, generally favor uh, the public, uh, I mean the charter uh, uh, schools that are public schools. In the state of Florida, we've had charter schools for 10 years. Um, came under uh, uh, Governor Jeb Bush. Uh, last year, just as a, for example, and I'm sure there are mixed results. I know Mr. Polis is a major advocate of this, and he just cited to, in his area, where uh, there's a tremendous success. Well, I happen to have, in the constituency I serve, a substantial amount of failure and limited success. And in the state of Florida last year, 31 of um, uh, 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 the schools that received the grade of F uh, pursuant to um, uh, the state's uh, uh, determination, 15 of those 31 schools were charter schools. And I come to a concern. While it is true that public education capital outlay is a limited part of uh, a school's budget in Florida, I don't know about uh, uh, elsewhere. I would imagine it's the same. Uh, our funding comes from property taxes uh, uh, for our schools. In this instance, the now governor of the state of Florida uh, had control of $55 million, he and uh, the legislature. They allowed uh, for that $55 million that was available to build and repair uh, schools, all $55 million of it went to charter schools, and the traditional uh, public schools got zilch. Now, I, I believe people ought to follow their ideology and all of that, but I know where there are some dilapidated traditional schools, and I would hope, um, uh, following Ms. Slaughter's line, that we would be of a mind to want to uplift all schools. Now, governors are going to go around and around. They're going to be Democrat, Republican, Independent, and crazy, mm -hmm. and not crazy uh, as well. But all things considered, what were you all considering when you put the governors in the business of controlling this kind of money? And Ms. Moore's argument and mine are at least there are two governors um, uh, that uh, have demonstrated uh, that they uh, favor uh, charter schools over uh, the constitutionally mandated uh, public schools. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I, I guess I would just say I think we tried to work it out here where we tried to provide pretty substantial deference to the states on how to do this and, and to do it uh, 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 with a state entity, which would be the edu state educational uh, uh, administration or, or office of, of, of state education. Uh, some states have a charter school board, I think, that, that, the, that the governor listens to, uh, uh, or the governor, uh, and the states would have to make their determination. We've had outliers. We've, we, you know, in every one of these programs, you have outliers from time to time. One governor wants to go off in this direction and one there. But generally, in the case of education, they do it in consultation with their board of education, state board of education, or if they have a state a superintendent of instruction or whatever the various offices are, and that's what we've tried to honor. I think to take the governor out of the picture uh, doesn't make any sense, and, but, but we tried to, to suggest that this would be a collaborative effort with the, uh, with the state educational agency and the, and the, uh, uh, and the governor. But, uh, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to, to uh, 
to draw a federal legislation for what each and every governor might do, especially when they're rotating in in different states at different times, and, and we don't know what, what they believe in. But the fact of the matter is these are still within that public system, you know, and, and uh, we got to sort of trust the, the governance that the, that the state has and then try to give them additional responsibility uh, for that role that they're playing. Well, I, I think if I might, uh, we're, we're trying to make charter schools more readily available for more populations where they're successful and allow them to replicate if they're successful. And frankly, one of the things about charter schools, it's pretty easy to make them go away uh, if, if they're not doing well. But we wanted as much opportunity as possible to allow this with the limited funds we have. As uh, Mr. Miller said, the states are organized differently with different powers. Some have boards, some don't. And we just wanted to open up the opportunity, as much opportunity as we can, for the, stu for the states to work within their own system to allow this uh, expansion and replication of successful charter schools. We also hold the, the authorizers of those charter schools at the local level uh, more accountable. Very often school boards or others have authorized charter schools and they sort of walked away and come back in five years to find out what happened. They weren't paying attention. And they should have known that this school just wasn't thriving. The kids were getting shortchanged here. You know, we've been working on a model, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think about a third are very successful compared to the existing schools. About a third run like the existing schools and about a third perform poorly than the existing schools. And, and that's unacceptable. Yeah. So we're trying to step up that. So I think even if the governor suggests that, that, these, that somehow there's some way to personally hand out charters, somebody's going to be on the hook in a, in a, in a much clearer time frame to, with the passage of this legislation than what's happening now in my, in my own state or wherever. Some of these schools have been allowed to languish, and those children have lost several years of educational opportunity. And just because you're a charter doesn't mean everything's, everything's okay. Somebody's got to well, check. Well, well what, is, what is happening is there is, as you would expect, a bit of a creep into the traditional school no, system. I, I, uh, the the charter schools were supposed to provide their own facilities. And now we are finding uh, that they are, are requesting additional funding. Um, and uh, the, the harsh truth for me is that I'm, I'm not quarreling with um, uh, education moving <coughs> forward. What I would have done if regulation was what was a hindrance uh, to certain educational institutions and is supposed to benefit charter schools by relieving those burdens, then it would seem to me that it would have been simpler to just relieve the burdens of all the schools and let them operate without regulation the way they're doing in Florida. And I understand that each state is going to approach this uh, with its own scope, uh, but we've gone off the chain. And I just want you to understand that uh, our governor, and tell him I said so, um, is uh, in another league when it comes to not following or uh, uh, the patterns of uh, uh, constitutionally mandated undertakings. We ain't heard enough from him yet, but what we've heard so far indicates that it's bad news for education and health care and a whole bunch of other things. Thanks. Question. Mr. Chairman, I, I was going to ask a, the same, a similar question, just uh, is there a specific amount set aside for capital or is there any amount set aside for capital uh, expenditures in charter schools? I don't remember the cost. Uh, yeah, if, will the gentleman yield? Sure. Yeah, so in the expansion or replication, the schools are allowed to use, um, what was the final number, up to 30%? For, for the uh, yeah. Piece? Well, in the, in the expansion or replication piece, they can use some of that, a certain portion of it, I believe up to 30%. Is that right, 30%? Up to 30 percent. They don't have to use that for capital, but they are allowed to use up to 30 percent for capital. The credit enhancement piece deals strictly with capital, uh, and that deals with them borrowing, but it's a credit enhancement piece from the federal side. One other question. Um, is, there a, is, there, is there a virtual component to this at all? What? For virtual, all like a virtual, virtual, virtual yeah. schools as opposed yeah, to brick and mortar? We, we allow that. There's yeah. Combinations. Uh, some states have had more trouble with all online. Is there flexibility with that? Yeah. Okay. I, I would like to say something about Florida. 
Uh, we, we have had that bill. Uh, it was actually done by myself and uh, former Congressman Alan Boyd and, um, and another fellow by the name of Joe Tedder back in 1993, I believe, signed by Governor Lawton Childs, not Jeb Bush. And um, that, that bill uh, has always struggled for capital costs because the school system did not want to give up any money. Uh, the monies that we're talking about here <coughs> are the, the, the school district funds through property taxes to uh, two mills uh, for capital expenditures. That's not the money we're talking about. That's the major construction. What it is is the public education capital outlay program, which is funded by utility taxes. That's the $55 million. And I think it, maybe this pendulum swung a little too far, but it was swung the other way too far before because there was no money from 1993 forward or very teeny little bit of money for capital expenditures for charter schools. And so uh, the student money is going to follow the child. The FTE is going to follow the child. So, so there's plenty of opportunities for it. It's just, you know, if, unless you had somebody that gave you some kind of endowment, you couldn't start a charter school because you had no place to do it. So I, I think it may have gone too far, but, but it, it's probably in long overdue. And so if you spread that over from 1993 until 2011, uh, that's probably not a whole lot of money, the $55 million. I, I think it's good that we do invest a little bit of money in some capital because I think that, one, that, that actually is holding back the expansion, not necessarily the funding for the per-student cost. It's the, it's the capital. I thank the gentleman, and uh, I thank uh, both Mr. Klein and Mr. Miller for bringing forward this important bill. Um, before I came to this Congress, uh, I founded two charter schools and served as superintendent of one, so I, I bring some experience, experience in this area, and this really, uh, with this bill, uh, ups the ante on the quality of the federal program, and I appreciate that. Now, I think many of us would agree with my gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, who said, you know, by no means does doing good work on charter schools means we shouldn't do anything else for anything else in public education. Of course it doesn't mean that. We all care deeply about all public schools. Um, of course, we're talking about this discrete piece here today. And the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Hastings, also said, of course, not all charter schools are good. And we all agree with that, as, as Mr. Miller said, roughly a third, a third, a third. And one piece that this bill adds is an expansion and replication piece. So um, we had a small federal piece for expansion and replication, but that was kind of at the, at the whim of the secretary and very small. It's now being pushed out to the states so they can expand and replicate what works. So really looking at that third of charter schools that work, that, that have a model that works, that serve at-risk kids, that are helping them learn, and saying, okay, what does it take to expand? It might mean expanding an elementary school to a K-8. It might mean just serving 20 percent more kids with the model that works. Uh, Mr. Sessions uh, mentioned the Ricardo Flores Magon Academy. Um, tremendous results that came in uh, in the top 10 percent in our state in reading and math. Uh, and this is a school that if you looked at the demographics, um, uh, you, you, you would not have expected that based on uh, the, co the usual correlation between demographics and performance. A school like that would then be able to, which by the way, couldn't have gotten off the ground without Title V startup grant in the first place under the old authorization, would now be able to compete for money at the state level to expand or replicate their model, uh, which is a very exciting new piece. I also want to um, thank Chairman Klein and, and, um, and Mr. Miller for improving the bill in a variety of ways, including prioritizing states that uh, authorize charters to be their own school food authority and including transportation considerations, um, which I think we all agree are critical to getting uh, kids to, to charter schools. Uh, and I appreciate the consideration of the majority and minority committee staff and including many of the aspects of Mr. Paulson and mine All-Star Act um, in, this, in this provision as well. Um, I, I do have, uh, and I wish Mr. Sessions were here because he raised a very important topic of, of special education and and, and one of the uh, key components is looking at making sure that all students achieve in our charter schools, and we, we disaggregate the data to do that as we have since the inception of No Child Left Behind. And I just wanted to clarify, in fact, that one of the amendments um, that's before us today, Mr. King's amendment, uh, which says that it would strike the language that increases student academic achievement for subgroups of students described in Section 1111, just in kind of reference to Mr. Sessions' uh, question, if Mr. King's amendment was incorporated into this bill, just to be clear, uh, we would not even be able to look at whether special education students were, were achieving and learning uh, in consideration of the grants. Is that, I would ask you both if that's correct. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, I, I wish Mr. Sessions would, was here to, uh, to say that as that was his, his concern in particular. Um, I think with this really bipartisan effort, and this truly is a, a, a great bipartisan uh, piece of legislation perhaps, 
uh, one of the most significant of, of this Congress thus far and hopefully a model for what we can accomplish going forward. It really exemplifies what the House can do to support good public education uh, and to improve our, our future. I think uh, proponents of charter schools, myself among them, would certainly not claim that charter schools solve our problems with public education. I've never heard anybody say that. And In fact, when others try to uh, throw that straw man, it's very irritating because that's uh, not what we're talking about here. Uh, what we are talking about is something that works for some kids. And uh, if you've been to any of the schools, charter schools that, that work and defy the odds and the expectations and help students learn, um, you can't help but ask yourself, uh, why aren't we doing more of this where we can? Um, until we, we find a silver bullet, if there is one, uh, we know what works for at-risk kids today. Uh, and with this uh, Charter School Bill, HR 2218, that's before us today, uh, we can make sure that those kinds of opportunities can reach more um, at-risk families in our country. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Polis. Gentlemen, thank you uh, both very much for being here. We look forward to having your measure considered on the floor uh, tomorrow. Uh, I don't know how far we're going to get on it in light of the schedule we've got tomorrow uh, evening, but we'll... Look forward to beginning the process. We'll now uh, proceed with uh, consideration of H.R. 1892, and we're happy to welcome the distinguished chairman of the uh, Select Committee on Intelligence, Mr. Rogers. And I saw the uh, ranking member, Mr. Ruppersberger, was here earlier. I don't know he if he may have uh, just stepped out. Okay, for well, a please, uh, without, without any uh, objection, your uh, statement will appear in the record in its entirety, and we welcome your summary. And thanks very much for the very important work that you do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you so much for uh, having us here today. Uh, the annual intelligence authorization bill is, I think, one of the most important bills the House uh, passes each year. Uh, it is appropriate that we're considering this bill on the anniversary of 9-11, or at least the, the week before. Uh, the bill provides and allocates resources for critical national security programs, including those that detect, prevent, and disrupt potential terrorist attacks against the American people. And despite this, uh, for several years, I think our committee had a very difficult time, almost six years for a real bona fide uh, intelligence authorization bill, uh, and it was done through appropriations. And you can imagine there are lots of uh, room for improvement when it comes to oversight when that happens. So last year, uh, uh, Mr. Ruppersberger and I took uh, a significant step to break this cycle and restore meaningful oversight by enacting and, and working together in a bipartisan way to pass a fiscal year 2011 Intelligence Authorization Act uh, that enjoyed wide bipartisan support and was signed into law by the President. Similarly, this year's bill enjoyed bipartisan support within the significant assistance, again, of my distinguished ranking member, Mr. Ruppersberger, uh, and was adopted by a voice vote. Uh, and this year's bill is a little different, Mr. Chairman, uh, and more important for two reasons. First, it continues to assert a strong role for Congress uh, in intelligence oversight. And second, uh, the enactment of the authorization bill is critical to ensure proper guidelines for intelligence budgets. Uh, and with the growing responsibility of the intelligence community in keeping America safe, I can't tell you how important I think both Mr. Ruppersberger and I believe that is. Uh, the authorization... Uh, and by the way, we went back uh, and for the, for the first time together, and this is how we spent our summer vacation, going through the budget from stem to stern. I mean, every line item we looked at, and uh, with uh, both uh, the ranking member, myself, and our staffs, to find some places where we could find savings. We did not believe that the intelligence community, after its significant growth, didn't have some places where we could find savings. But we both made a commitment that we would not reduce anything if it impacted the mission. And we're pleased to say that we have found a very significant amount of money open in the classified annex, in the classified setting for members to come down, where we merged some services. We, we got creative, and the community helped us do it. It was a true partnership, uh, and we did find some money to save uh, along the way. So we're pleased with that, and we do believe jointly that this will not impact our ability to continue to collect and prevent terrorist uh, and other threats uh, national security oriented to the United States. Uh, the Commission's, uh, excuse me, the Committee's assistance this year, I, I appreciate very much in posting the rules to the Committee uh, for, of the print of the bill that reflects additional work on part of the Committee to achieve a bipartisan and bicameral bill by pre-conferencing a number of the provisions in the bill uh, that uh, we included from the Senate bill. And we thought it was very important to reach out to our Senate colleagues and try to pre-conference this bill given its urgent need uh, and we were, again, looking for a bipartisan, bicameral product that we could get passed and signed into law, and we think we've accomplished that 
uh, today with some, uh, some additions we hope to obtain through this committee. Uh, but that pre-conferencing we believe is important. We work well with our Senate counterparts, both the Republican and Democrat, Diane Feinstein, the chair, and Saxby Chambliss, the vice chair. Uh, I hope because of that that the committee will strongly support the consideration of the Rules Committee print uh, as the base text of the House, uh, House considers uh, uh, considered legislation. In addition, I hope the committee will make an order the manager's amendment to the bill, which I have offered, which reflects some of the agreements between Mr. Ruppersberger and the Senate at the last hour. We all know how those uh, details sometimes are harder to work out early but are easier to work out toward the end. We, we are able to do that. And I think it's incredibly important for the bill that that manager's amendment is supported by the committee in order to make sure this continues to be a bipartisan bill. Uh, I, I, there, there are some provisions in that manager's amendment that I would like to see remain, but again, in the, in the consistency of getting this bill passed and having the oversight of some $80 billion, the unclassified number uh, in intelligence and the policies therein I, are incredibly important, and I believe the manager's amendment reflects uh, that need and necessity. Um, I do believe that uh, there's some detainee uh, negotiation language in there that, that uh, uh, there is already a clear legal obligation into, uh, in the National Security Act for the administration to provide materials. Um, however, the annual authorization bill is too important uh, to oversight is not the proper forum for a contentious dispute over documents uh, that can and should be conducted through other means uh, that the committees have at their disposal. And uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Rupert Berker and I have asked that uh, we're going to work through those issues. Manager's Amendment uh, is intended to ensure the bill continues to receive, again, that bipartisan support. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your committee's continued support on critical intelligence issues, uh, and I'll be glad to answer any questions following the ranking members. Yes, sir. Mr. D uh, Chairman Dreyer, Ranking Member uh, Slaughter, and members of the committee. Uh, first, uh, Chairman Rogers and I, when he became chairman, I became ranking, had a commitment that the stakes are so high in national security intelligence that we were going to do whatever we could to resolve our issues, not only uh, Republican and Democrat, but also with the Senate, Republican and Democrat. And we've developed some relationships, and we think we are able to move forward with the bill. Uh, in May, the House uh, passed a um, the House Intelligence Committee passed a bipartisan Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal 2012. The bill makes smart choices by trimming where possible, eliminating duplicative efforts, and ensuring we do not affect the current critical capabilities that keep our country safe. In an effort to get the bill passed in both the House and the Senate and signed into law before the, the beginning of the fiscal year on uh, this October 1st, Chairman Rogers and I have been negotiating with the Senate over the August recess to work out the differences between the Senate and the House versions of the bill. In a rare move, the version of the unclassified legislative text before the Rules Committee today and posted on the Rules Committee website is not the text that was passed out of the Intelligence Committee back in May. It includes two controversial provisions related to Guantanamo Bay detainees and another making the Director of National Security Agency a Senate-confirmed position. The controversial Gitmo provision requires the Director of National Intelligence in coordination with the Department of State to provide the Intelligence Committees with information concerning the transfer or potential transfer of Gitmo detainees. The provision requires that all Department of State cables, memorandum, and reports containing info relating to Gitmo be turned over to Congress. This is not only a massive undertaking to supply all of this paperwork to Congress, it's costly, it's du duplicative. It could also severely hurt diplomatic relations with our foreign part, uh, partners. Foreign countries will not want to talk frankly to an American diplomat if they think the comments are going to be widely disseminated all over the Hill. We need to learn from WikiLeaks. I'm concerned that making the Director of National Intelligence Agency a Senate-confirmed position can bring the head of the NSA unnecessarily into the political realm. NASA, NSA is in my district in Maryland, and I, well, I would hate to see a nomination process held up for political reasons in this climate and how it would affect national security. These two provisions garnered a veto threat from the White House, and I can see why. The minority did not agree to include these provisions in the base text before the Rules Committee today. In fact, we uh, expressed our strong opposition to the move. The committee did not have a chance to vote on these provisions, but they were passed uh, to the Rules Committee and are being considered today. I understand Chairman Rogers plans to introduce a manager's amendment. You've heard him t uh, testify to that. Uh, withdrawals to Gitmo and NSA director provisions. If, these, uh, if this measure fails and these controversial provisions remain, I fear the House may veto the bill. Uh, if these provisions can be successfully eliminated, I would like to see the rest of the bill become law. Uh, in this bill, we make great investments in space, cyber, terrorism, and, and uh, for support for the warfighter. 
This is what our constituents want us to do. It gives our intelligence professionals the resources, capabilities, and authorities they need to keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rupert. Let me just observe that uh, having seen the, uh, the bipartisan work that took place between the chairman and the ranking member of the uh, Education Committee and now the bipartisan cooperation for the Intelligence Committee, I'm considering proposing a five-week break between each Rules Committee meeting. Uh, <laughs> we really consider legislation on the floor. So, yeah. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the chair and the ranking member, and I have no questions. Thank you, gentlemen, for the work you do, which we have no understanding of, <laughs> and it's probably better. Yeah. Uh, but, Mr. Rufusberger, yeah. do I understand that you are objecting to this because of the things in the manager's amendment? Not an amendment, but in the manager's amendment. Is that correct? No, no. I'm, where the manager's amendment is what I will agree to. Because what you've agreed to, but there's the, a... The chairman will pull out the two provisions that the White House has uh, given us a veto. That are in the manager's amendment. Or, they're taken or out. They're taking at, taken out in the manager's amendment. The the, the Gitmo is taken. What? Oh. Staff said said I object to rules committee text. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the, the managers, if I may. Yeah. The manager's amendment fixes the fixes, fixes the, the problem. Fixes the problem. Right. To your satisfaction, Mr. Yeah, yes, yes, I am. All right. In fact, uh, right now, if, if, well, I'll wait. No, go ahead. There, there are five amendments that I put in because I was not able to see the manager's amendment just to protect the flank, so to speak. Just in the and, event. And that's all taken care of in the manager's amendment, so I would withdraw all those five amendments that I put in. All right. So then everything is fine. Everything is fine. We are going to have a group hug following this meeting. We'd like to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, well, th I, thank, I want to thank you for your work as well, and I like... Uh, my ranking member, I'm not quite sure all that goes on in the committee, but one of the things that I'm concerned about is, uh, is proper oversight of where some of our aid goes and how, it, how, how it's spent. And I just want to call your attention to a letter that uh, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky and I just sent to the Secretary of State, uh, the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, and the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, regarding uh, asking for a comprehensive accounting of U.S. assistance to the Colombian government's Department of Administrative Security, that they call it the DAS, which operates uh, out of the office of the presidency um, uh, during a period from August 7, 2002 to August uh, 7, 2010. And the reason why we do that is, as you, know, as you may know, the uh, Colombian Attorney General's office is undertaking a very aggressive investigation uh, and uh, there's a series of prosecutions of, about illegal activities that, are, that occurred, that were carried out by the DAS during these, these particular years. Uh, and in particular, uh, uh, surveillance, wiretapping um, of political opponents, of, uh, of opposition political parties, of trade unionists, of uh, human rights defenders, and, um, and the, and the uh, what is particularly outrageous is that um, they, there are established connections between the information gathered and direct threats against a lot of these people, and in many cases, assassinations that were carried out. Um, and uh, there was a Washington Post article while we were uh, on break that said that, uh, that, that asserts that U.S. aid may have been implicated in, in some of these abuses of, of power. And I don't, I don't know whether the committee is aware of it, but um, you know, money that our intelligence services are providing their intelligence and services may have been used in, in these illegal activities, which I think is outrageous. Uh, and it resulted in the deaths of a number of people. And, um, and it just seems to me that, uh, one, that we need a full accounting, and I hope the com committee will do that. But in the meantime, it, it would seem to me, given the, you know, the uh, severity of some of the, of, of, of the, of what the Colombian Attorney General is even charging, uh, that it, that why are we still sending aid to, uh, to that intelligence service? Uh, shouldn't we withhold aid until um, pending the outcome of the investigations, uh, given the fact that we know that there's, a, there's been established abuse already? We don't know how deep the abuse goes. But it just seems to me that when we talk about oversight, I mean, I worry about, you know, our money and our resources, you know. I mean, our, our jeeps or our surveillance equipment being used to carry out illegal activities. Uh, and in this case, we've already established that that's occurring. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a copy of the letter, but it's, it's just, you know, we're, some of the um, 
it deeply concerns me because I don't want U.S. money being used in an improper way or uh, supporting illegal activities, uh, you know, un unknowingly, obviously. But still, uh, you know, if it's our, our resources or our wiretaps or our jeeps or our whatever, um, or our money using to pay for some of this, that's, that's, that to me is, a, is outrageous. And I mean, I will be happy to take, to take the letter and take it under consideration. I, I would be a little cautious in the sense that sometimes the intelligence services get lumped into other state aid that may or may not find its way there. The, the criteria, there are lots of uh, protocols on the money that our intelligence services provide and accounting of that. Now, I'm all, all for the accounting, and we should account for the money that we spend over there. But sometimes I think it's confused, and I think the, the newspaper article may have confused the pots of money. One of the things in that newspaper article is they asked Ambassador Brownfield had a briefing with a number of people who work in the embassy, including those who work in intelligence, but, you know, and asked how many of them have had connections with this agency. The reason why the letter goes to all these people here is because everybody raised their hand and said that, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've had some dealings with we've provided some support to this to this uh, agency. So it's not just the, the CIA, it's, it's others. That's why sure. the letter goes to everybody. Sure. I'm just, you know, I just want to make sure that, you know, that, you know, whether it's state or whether it's a central intelligence agency, the Department of Defense or the Department of Justice, that funds that we provide, you know, other intelligence services uh, are not used to carry out illegal activities, in this case, the assassination of human rights defenders and trade unions. And I, I just, I mean, I, it's, 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 uh, it, and again, it's, I'm not, it's not just an, an accusation. There are actually prosecutions that have been carried out and there are, um, you know, confessions that have been obtained. And so I just want, I, I just think in terms of, that it's just something that's worth looking into because sure. I think it's a very serious matter, especially as we're, you know, everybody's clamoring to consider a Columbia Free Trade Agreement. I'd just like to make sure that, uh, you know, that this, this issue is, is clarified. But I'll, I'll give you a copy of the letter. Yeah. I hope the committee will look into it. Uh, let you. me respond by saying, first thing, Jan Schakowsky is on our committee. And uh, she, uh, within the last month, has made us aware of that. There are, uh, when you're dealing in the international realm, terrorism all over, we have there's certain mass of money. And believe me, that's part of our job with oversight and with the CIA or any agency that we have authority over to make sure that it's going to the right place. And we have hearings on this in different countries. Um, the, the issue, I think, has come up because of the free trade. There have been allegations, but I think the Attorney General now is investigating that, which is a positive, a positive thing. Um, but um, what most of our involvement has been and why we are so active in Colombia, there have been a tremendous amount of successes, I, I think, initially because when Arebi came in as president and now you have Santos, most of our focus in Colombia was in drugs. And, and, the, the, and we've come a long way. They've been able to take down the FARC. Uh, we had hostages there um, that, were, that we had for a long period of time. In fact, right now we're working with Colombia um, to try to deal and help uh, the Mexico issue because the Mexico issue is totally out of control. It's getting worse, and we have to, de have to deal with it. But when we get these complaints or allegations, uh, if it's in our jurisdiction, we will clearly look into it. And, and you know, I'm, I know Jan has been involved in other – in her role when we were in the majority, uh, which was more fun, um, the, the – uh, I've tried them both. It really is yeah, more fun. Right, it I is more fun. That. But, but uh, uh, she was involved in an investigation uh, in, uh, involving some other issues like that. So if you right. get us the information. I guess, I guess my only point is that this has been going on for a long time. Yeah. All right? And, uh, and it's established that it's been going on for a long time. It's not an accusation. I mean, there are prosecutions going on, and, I, and the Attorney General of Columbia deserves credit for carrying them out. Unfortunately, you know, it's still a very, very dangerous place. So, but the point of the matter is it's been going on for a very long, long time, and and we've been supporting. Well, that, that, that's the issue that I want to know. I don't know whether I, I'm not. I'm not sure we would know this. definitively that. I, I will tell I'm you that sometimes we deal with agencies, right. but that that part yeah. the, there may be other activity they're not aware of. Well, I, well, I would hope then that until that, that one of the recommendations of the intelligence committee would be that we would not be continuing oh, no. to support this agency pending investigations to find out you know exactly you know what happened because there's no question that our government provided assistance to this, uh, to this agency. That, that's, not in, that's not in question. Um, the issue that we have knowledge of. Yeah. Yeah. Or did or that our, particular assistance result in that activity? I, mean, I think that's where we're not sure. We used to, you know, wiretap a, that, that's very you know, relevant. A, a, a trade unionist yeah. for no reason other than the fact he was a trade unionist. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pass this Yeah, we'd be Thank eager you. to get it. Thank you. 
very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, uh, different than the ranking member and Mr. McGovern, uh, have the good fortune of having served with both these gentlemen, and I do know a little bit about what they do, and I am genuinely appreciative of all, all the effort. One thing that was a continuing frustration for members of the committee was to hear from the uh, general body of Congress um, not criticism but concern and then at the very same time uh, not going to uh, the spaces of uh, the Intelligence uh, Committee and reviewing uh, as is every member's right um, uh, the uh, provisions that are being offered that are classified and in the unclassified uh, sections. So I would urge members not in the Rules Committee per se, but uh, generally, uh, to take advantage of that opportunity uh, if they have concerns. I, I note uh, uh, significantly over the years that very few did, and uh, it, it is a concern of mine. Uh, Mike, I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, specifically, I think uh, that uh, of the amendments that I reviewed uh, uh, that Mr. Wolf has one uh, that uh, seems to make um, uh, uh, some sense. I will, once he is uh, in, in the chair, I'll ask him about uh, some concerns I have about his provision. Uh, but I certainly think it ought to be debated, and I'm curious, have you had an opportunity to review it? And I know you and I especially uh, spent a lot of time on the uh, DNI and had uh, uh, continuing concerns through the years uh, regarding his standing up and uh, ongoing activities as far as oversight is concerned. Uh, while I don't welcome or relish another bureaucracy, uh, at the very same time, added oversight seems to make some sense. Now, I don't know whether you've seen uh, Frank's uh, amendment or not, but it certainly seems like uh, is something that at least ought to uh, be made in order and that we uh, should debate it uh, uh, to determine what the general membership will feel about it. Sure. I, I mean, my only concern, and you and I have worked uh, many hours on the DNI and trying yeah. to get it to function cor correctly according to congressional intent, you and I work jointly on right. many amendments together. Right. Uh, my only concern is that there, uh, there are – Outside advisory groups now that I don't, I'm not sure, I don't believe that were there when you were there, mm -hmm. uh, created for that second look to give that outside perspective. So there are people who are not directly affiliated. They may have had a past or uh, they moved on, but can come in. They have the right clearances and can kind of do these things. As a matter of fact, um, we're establishing and actually by an act of Congress. Uh, a review on technology is a great example. So there's a new board that comes in, and its sole purpose is to go through and make some very hard conclusions uh, uh, to the community about where they are on technology. And it's going to be specifically focused on technology. And we've got others for uh, overhead architecture and others for mm -hmm. other programs that we have. Mm -hmm. My concern is this might it might confuse the progress that we've made. I, I think it's a great idea, and I think to some degree – they listened to Mr. Wolf, uh, and some of these were self-generated. Some of these were generated by uh, encouragement from Congress. I, I just get concerned that if you can get too much of this as well. I understand, but yeah. it hadn't passed. I'm just asking the chair whether yeah. or not he would agree that it should be made in order at least yeah. to be debated. Well, I mean, I, I believe that to the uh, to Chairman Dreyer, but uh, you know, that would be my – I would express my concerns <laughs> in that way. And, and thanks for the work that you did on the committee. I think it resulted uh, in us getting to, to a great place where we are now. Thank you. Let me yep. say for the record that I'm going to encourage this committee to make an order to Mr. Uh, Wolf's amendments. I'm going to say that Mr. Newton, 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 i am going to say that mr newton 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 i am going to say that and I just want to remind you that the way I look at it, 60 is now the new 40, so you're in good shape. Uh -huh. That makes so me 28. So, so that it. means you're 28. Good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you both very much Thank for being here. Much. Thanks to the, uh, to the you uh, bet. committee. Let me say, uh, I see Mr. Wolf here, and let me say that, I, again, I'm going to encourage the committee to make an order, uh, the Wolf Amendment that has been submitted to the uh, 
to the Rules Committee. Having said that, uh, we certainly welcome you to the committee. Well, I'll be, I'll be very brief with that, and thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman and members. And, and this was an amendment that I was working with Jane Harmon on right. uh, before she left, and a co-sponsor of it is Sue Myrick and uh, Peter King. And I will end my testimony with reading a, a uh, statement by Georgetown University professor, Dr. Bruce Hoffman, who wrote uh, for the National Interest on October uh, 2010. He said, the logic behind Congressman Wolf's idea is simple and makes eminent sense, since both the U.S. intelligence community and our national security and law enforcement agency are overwhelmed with data information a multiplicity of immediate inbox-driven issues that continually challenge their ability to think strategically and in terms of a patently involving dynamic, multidimensional threat. And he goes on, the red team concept would represent a new approach to the counterterrorism that would potentially enable the United States to stay one step ahead of our adversaries. And then he goes on to strongly support it. It's a bipartisan thing. It's basically a team B to look at the whole issue radicalization. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wolf. And I should just say that uh, you're mentioning Georgetown University is a perfect cue for me to, uh, as I have in the past, recognize that we have our distinguished chaplain, Father Pat Conroy, with us here, uh, as he has been in the past on the Rules Committee, looking over your shoulder as you mentioned Georgetown. So thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Wolf at all? No, but. Yeah. Frank, would you respond to what Mike said, or do you think it. it it may serve your, your measure as an interference to ongoing oversight? No, it, it would deal only with the, uh, the radicalization issue, and it would transcend all of the intelligence gotcha. agencies, and not just with the FBI, and not just with, it would transcend, and it would be an advisory okay. group outside. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, Ms. Slaughter, I'm sorry. The, uh, well, I said I'd recognize anybody, so yeah, of course I, I, I just have you. never had a chance to do this before, and I, I really want to do it. I want to tell Mr. Wolf. Uh, that over the years that we served together, that I have so appreciated uh, your legislation. Uh, and, and I think, to me, you are an exemplary case of someone who really doing things for the common good. Thank you for that. Well, thank you. For well, now we're really glad you came to the table and, uh, and uh, took the chance to be heard. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much thank for being here, Mr. Thank Wolf. You, I know we all share that view. That will conclude the uh, hearing for consideration of 1892, and uh, the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee report a structured rule for consideration of H.R. 2218, the Empowering Parents Through Quality Charter Schools Act. The rule provides one hour of general debate on H.R. 2218, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Education and the Workforce. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of H.R. 2218. The rule makes an order of the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Education and the Workforce now printed in the bill as an original bill for purpose of amendment and provides that the amendment shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against the committee amendment. The rule makes an order only those amendments to H.R. 2218 printed in Part A, the report accompanying the resolution. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to demand for division of the question. All points of order against the amendments printed in Part A of the report are waived. The rule provides one motion to recommit H.R. 2218 with or without instructions. The rule further provides for consideration of H.R. 1892, the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012, under a structured rule. The rule provides one hour of general debate on H.R. 1892, equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of H.R. 1892. The rule makes an order as original text for the purpose of amendment. The Rules Committee print dated August 31, 2011, and provides that the committee print shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against the Rules Committee print. The rule makes an order only those amendments to H.R. 1892 printed in Part B of report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report equally divided, 
and control by the proponent and an opponent shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in Part B of the report. The rule provides that the chairman of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence or, des or his designee may offer amendments and block consisting of amendments printed in Part B of the report not earlier disposed of. Amendments and blocks shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for 10 minutes equally divided, and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence or their designees shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The original proponent of an amendment included in such amendments and block may insert a statement in the congressional record immediately before the disposition of the amendments and block. The rule provides one motion to recommit H.R. 1892 with or without instructions. Finally, the rule provides that a motion to proceed with regard to a joint resolution of disapproval specified in the Budget Control Act shall be in order only if offered by the majority leader or his designee and may be offered even following the sixth day specified in the Budget Control Act, but not later than the legislative day of September 14, 2011. You've heard the motion of the gentlewoman from Grandfather Community. Let me just uh, at the outset uh, say that uh, Obviously, uh, it is somewhat unusual for us to consider uh, both measures under one rule, but the request that the President had made to address a joint session of Congress, we know that that creates uh, challenges for us, even though we are going to meet those, including the security sweep that will have to take place tomorrow uh, before the President comes to uh, the Capitol. Uh, I believe that the rule does make an order um, amendments that allow for virtually every issue before us to be considered. We, in fact, on the charter schools bill uh, have five Democratic, uh, two bipartisan, one Republican amendment made in order, and uh, on the Intel bill, eight Democratic and three Republican amendments made in order. Uh, so we've seen a great sense of bipartisanship, and I hope very much that we'll be able to proceed uh, with that uh, as we move ahead here. So any discussion or amendment? Ms. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have an amendment. I move the committee report an open rule for consideration of H.R. 2218 and 1892 so that all members will have the opportunity to offer amendments to these important pieces of legislation. For the motion of the gentleman, any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the slaughter amendment. Those in favor will say aye. 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 No. 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 Those have it. Those have it. The motion is not agreed to. The further amendments. Mr. McGovern. Mr. Chairman, I, I move that the committee make an order and provide any necessary waivers for amendment number 10 offered by the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Peters, which would add post-secondary persistence and graduation rates to the criteria used to measure the progress of charter schools. Heard the motion of the gentleman. Any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. 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 No. 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 I ask for a vote. Mr. Chairman, report uh, a vote. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions, no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Scott. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis? Aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Clerk report the total. Four yeas, six nays. Let me just say that this is an issue that, uh, that I do believe needs to be addressed, and there has been discussion with the committee leadership to have this addressed in a larger uh, manner uh, in the future. Uh, oh, if I could comment on that as well. We, sure. we were very pretty disappointed because... Uh, by all accounts, this was a germane amendment. Well, I, there was, as I said, a discussion with the committee leadership that this is, is an issue that does need to be addressed. And so that is, uh, that but is, not now. Right, right. Any further amendments? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee make an order and provide any necessary waivers for amendment number seven offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamundi. Um, which would give priority to eligible entities that plan to use materials made in America uh, for the construction and renovation of school facilities. For the motion of the gentleman, any uh, further Good. discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the Hastings Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. 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 No. Mr. Chairman, I ask for I ask for recording. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions, no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Scott, Mr. Webster, no. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Report the total. 
four yeas, six nays. And the motion is not agreed to. Further members, Mr. Yes, Mr. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. No, I have one more. I move that the committee make an order and provide any necessary waivers for amendment number 12 offered by the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Murphy, which would allow the head of an element of the intelligence community to consider a jobs impact statement which outlines the effect of an award or a contract on domestic employment. The motion of the gentleman. Any further discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the Hastings Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. 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 I'm not sure the noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is not agreed to. Mr. Polis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that the committee make an order and provide any necessary waivers for Amendment Number 4 offered uh, by me, which would facilitate charter schools' access to funding by prioritizing states that allow charter schools to be local education agencies. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I appreciate, uh, by the way, the inclusion of my other amendment, and in fact, the, the more important amendment uh, in this bill, um, uh, the, bill, the amendment that comes up more of the time. What this amendment that what does, and the reason it's important, is it's essentially uh, a paperwork reduction amendment. Um, some of the time, uh, districts don't necessarily want charter schools to have to go through them for applications for federal grants, uh, and it requires a little bit of uncompensated work at the district. Uh, that's why my home state of Colorado, with my support and overwhelming majority of our legislature, uh, allowed charter schools to be LEAs for federal purposes, uh, as have many other states. Um, however, having this uh, as a preference to uh, effectively reduce the duplication of paperwork by having every charter school application for federal funding come through a district where presumably, since it will have the district's imprintor on it, somebody will have to actually look at it and sign it also in causing unnecessary delays. While in the majority of cases it works out fine, um, I do uh, encourage this amendment to be considered um, because it would uh, solve a real problem um, with regard to the duplication of paperwork and unnecessary delays and applications of federal grants that aren't necessarily the fault of the charter school or the district. Well, let me just uh, thank the gentleman for his uh, very thoughtful amendment and say that it was uh, discussed uh, with uh, members of the committee and they're very interested in it. They would like to have some hearings that would explore further uh, the ramifications of this, and that's the reason that they uh, asked us to have this considered in more of a global way. And so for that matter, I'm, for that reason, I'm going to encourage my colleagues to, if, if my friend who obviously is very intimately involved, and I congratulate him on his great work and his history in working with charter schools, work with the committee, and uh, obviously the goal that the gentleman has is a very appropriate one, and so we hope that it will be able to be addressed in the future. So I'm going to encourage a no vote at this point. Those in favor of the Polis Amendment will say aye. Aye. Those no. And the chair of the noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? If not, the vote occurs on the motion of the gentlewoman from grandfather committee. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. And the no. chair of the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And the no. gentlewoman from grandfather community, Ms. Fox, will manage for the majority. Mr. Polis. For and minority. Mr. Polis, very appropriately. Two great educators. Thank you all very much. That should conclude our work for the week, and welcome back again. Please stands adjourned. And next week, too, maybe? Um, we may not have